Welcome to the Wilderness and Wondrous Love podcast, a podcast brought to you by Powell United Methodist Church to discuss the music of Lent. My name is Rachel Parfenchuk, and I'm Director of Music Ministries. And I'm Kim LaRue, Director of Adult Ministries. And today, our fourth podcast of Lent is a, a piece by Bach. The translation is O oh, Wondrous Love, but the name of it, Rachel is going to tell you, because I'm not sure I can pronounce it, <laughs> and she's going to tell you a lot about it. So I'm going to hand it back to Rachel. Okay, so the piece that we are talking about today is uh, titled O Grosse Lieb, which is from Bach's Oratorio, St. John Passion. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what an oratorio is first off. So an oratorio is going to be a large musical work that has an overarching narrative and it has characters, um, but it is not an opera or a musical. So an oratorio is typically going to be performed in what we call concert setting, which means all of the musicians are on stage, the conductor is on stage, your soloists are kind of up front, but there are no costumes, there's no staging, there's no real acting. We're telling this story exclusively through the music. So it's contrasted to our last podcast, which was only done in the Sistine Chapel in that kind of setting during Holy Week. This would be in a concert setting, which is a totally different exactly. thing. Exactly. Totally different thing. Um, I will note that most oratorios do lend themselves to being sacred in nature. So it's not necessarily always going to be sacred. However, the majority of oratorios are going to be sacred. Many of the other stories that we'll tell that aren't sacred would be your operas and your, your musicals and such. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> Bach wrote a couple different passions, but this is the St. John Passion. So this oratorio tells the passion story as told from the Gospel of John. Um, and that's kind of the main structure throughout this whole piece. So it's quite a large piece um, and it contains a lot of different sections. We have chorus numbers, we have arias, or this is what we call basically just a vocal solo. It's called an aria. Um, we have recitative style singing, which is kind of more of a spoken style chant that kind of continues the narrative. And then of course we have our chorales. And the piece that I've chosen to talk about today, O Grosse Leap, is an example of one of the chorales that Bach had chosen for this piece. Um, something really interesting that I think it, about these chorales are that, so Bach wrote all of this music. Um, however, the chorales that he chose to insert were actually not compositions by himself, but they were rather mostly Lutheran hymns that he borrowed from other people hmm. um, to insert into the different sections of this piece to comment on the narrative, to comment on what's happening. So this, this, this is the first chorale that happens in the piece, and um, <clears throat> it, it translates to a wondrous love O oh, love, all love excelling, wherefore thou made this veil of tears thy dwelling, the joys and pleasures of the world we cherish, cherish yet, the, yet thou must perish. So this, if you listen to the text, sounds oddly familiar to what wondrous love is this. It does. So this is another example of you know a, a piece of music from a totally different part of the world, a totally different time. This was much earlier than those hymns that we were talking about earlier, and yet we still have the same ideas. I love that. And so as we think about the Gospel of John, this text is the one that, that fits for me with this. I'm not sure this is exactly what Bach was using, but when you think about this really familiar text from John, John 3, um, 16 he says for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life and in this text that Rachel just read for us the perishing is talking about Jesus having to perish in order for eternal life to come so this is just interesting out of the Gospel of John the one little piece that I kind of can make a connection to in my own life as a person going through Lent is that peace and um, when we think about that um, we think about how as Rachel said it's timeless this idea that God's love has come to be with us and that just uh, the historicness of all of it that the God has been the same over time providing love and grace and mercy and we just have to recognize that we need God <laughs> you know we just have to and that's what Lent is all about is that recognition Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So one, one other thing that I think is interesting about this piece, so like we said earlier, this is just a small section from a much bigger piece. We're talking orchestra, chorus, the whole shebang. <laughs> um, but this particular piece um, comes right after, so when we're talking about the narrative, this comes right after Jesus has given himself up, but asks for his disciples to be let go. So I think that that's really interesting that, you know, when you think about the actual text of this piece, um, just kind of thinking about you know, what's actually happening in the narrative with Jesus at this at this moment. So when we listen to all of these pieces, it takes on a different context because we're not necessarily reflecting on the story after the fact, but these pieces are the story in the moment as it's happening, which I think has a totally different context to yes, it. Yes, and we can put ourselves in the story then. Uh, imagine that we are there. Mm -hmm. We are a disciple. Jesus is loving us enough to to convince them to let us go so mm -hmm. that we don't have to endure whatever that will be. That's amazing. It's a really cool thing that the that the oratorio does for us is that whole piece. And when we talk about the passion of Christ, what we're talking about is mostly from Palm Sunday to um all the way to Easter. Well, actually, actually to Good Friday, from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, because on Palm Sunday, you have the grand entry into Jerusalem where people are acclaiming him as king and as someone who is important. And by the time we get to Good Friday, of course, Jesus is being crucified. And one of the things that I think is important for us is that somehow during the Holy Week, we have to participate in something that doesn't just take us from Palm Sunday and the glory of that to Easter, but something during the week that helps us understand the depth of uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made, the depth of who we are as people, and the depth of how much we need God. And so by attending a service or by walking the Stations of the Cross or by doing your own devotion about that, that's really important. It helps us realize the, the ramification and the, um, the awesomeness of Easter when it gets there. Mm -hmm. It's not just hopping from one celebration to another celebration. Right. So this whole mass um, takes, not mass, sorry, the oratorio, oratorio mm -hmm. takes you during that whole week and you experience all of that, like you said, you're mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. it. It makes it more real, I think. Yeah. So the song again, um, the the words, the O wondrous love again, just such a great message during the time of Lent. Is there anything else? Um, what like is this particular um, chor chorale? It in a major key, minor key, or we back to Dorian? What are we doing with um, with? So in true Bach fashion, it wanders. it wanders. If you know anything about Bach, you know that his music is a bear. Um, the the harmonies he writes for the voice, like he writes for the writes for instruments. So there's just there's a lot of slippery harmonies and just really intricate things happening. Um, so uh, of course the important thing to notice here is that actually the original composer of this of this chorale is is actually not Bach because we know oh, that right. he inserted these 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 Lutheran hymns and so this actual piece was um, composed by Johann Hiermann. Um, and this is actually just stanza number seven of that chorale, okay. um, which is super interesting. And there is some discussion on, you know, Bach did have a say in what, um, you know, what chorales got inserted, but he didn't actually write that music himself, which I find really interesting. But he did do the harmonizations then. So these, these crazy harmonizations are his, do you think? Or was that also from the original, we don't really know at this point. I okay. uh, would rather imagine that it was probably actually the original composer. Okay. Um, but there is a, another interesting thing to note is that you know with these chorales, typically a chorale is going to be organ and voice. Okay. But this chorale is actually scored for flute, oboe, violin, viola, and continuo. So this has actually got quite a few instruments that are also. Um, um, playing during this chorale, which I would imagine was probably um, box work. Yes. Okay. That's cool. And I did have to sing Bach chorales a long time ago, and oh my goodness, every one of them were really difficult and interesting mm -hmm. and um, surprising sometimes mm -hmm. what he did with the harmonies. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a really cool thing about Bach. 
Yeah. All right. So today we've just done our fourth podcast, which is... Ogrosa Leap from Bach St. John Passion. And thank you for talking about it, because I don't know anything about any of that (laughs) stuff. That's just really amazing. And I'm Kim LaRue, Director of Adult Ministries here at Powell United Methodist Church. And I am Rachel Parfinchuk, Director of Music Ministries. Thank you for being with us, and have a happy Easter after this um, Lenten season is over, and we've enjoyed being with you during this whole time. Thank you. Thank you.